Hello again, it's Matt from Matchroom's Mutterings, and today we're going to discuss hate speech law. Specifically, I'm going to give you my reasons why hate speech laws are dumb. Now, I don't just use the word dumb for any reason. I use it very deliberately, and the reasons are this. Firstly, what does the word dumb mean? The way we use it the most in the Western world is that dumb means stupid, but that's not the, where the word actually originates. The word originally meant mute, or, as Dictionary.com defines it, lacking the power of speech. And hate speech laws are dumb precisely because they seek to take away our power of speech, our ability to speak to any issue that we choose to, any issue that we set our mind to. But they are also dumb in the fact that they lack intelligence. They are stupid. And the reason they are so stupid is because they limit our freedoms. They don't make us more free and more protected. They do the opposite. They take away our freedoms and take away our protections in the society because there is one fundamental freedom which is more important than every other freedom for a successful society and that is the ability to think and say what you are thinking the ability to speak freely the ability to not have your speech regulated by the state now we think in australia that we have freedom of speech but we don't the reason we think this is because most of what we watch is american tv shows and american movies and americans do have a fundamental right to freedom of speech in their constitution. It's the First Amendment, and basically, Congress shall make no law infringing or abridging or taking away their right to free speech, which includes the free speech of the individual and free speech of the press. Now, because of this American entertainment that we watch all the time, we tend to think that in Australia we have freedom of speech. And we also tend to think this because it's not very often that somebody gets in trouble for what they say, or at least it's not very often that we hear about it. But there are cases of people being taken through the ringer because of their speech. There was a case at the University of Queensland a few years ago. Many of you will know the cartoonist Bill Leake, who spent his last weeks and months of his life fighting a court case battle which his family believes caused his heart attack which ended his life because of his cartoons he wrote some cartoons that people considered offensive and because of this he was dragged through the court so we do not actually have freedom of speech here in australia we do have the ability to freely criticize and make statements about the government and we we're able to we have a lot more freedom when it comes to political satire, when we're making fun of things, we have a lot more freedom, but we do not actually have a basic fundamental right of freedom of speech in this country, and that is not a good thing. So, let me give you an example of a way in which our freedom of speech is abridged. Some of you, if you read the newspaper or watch different news shows, you will have heard of the Law 18C from the Racial Discrimination Act, Section 18C. Offensive behavior because of race, color, or national or ethnic origin. Now, let me read to you what the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975, Section 18C says. Offensive behavior because of race, color, or national or ethnic origin. It is unlawful for a person to do an act otherwise than in private if that act reasonably likely in all circumstances is to offend, insult, humiliate, or intimidate another person or group of people. And that act is done because of race, color, or national or ethnic origin or of the person or some or all of the people in that group. So, it makes certain acts unlawful. Um, the Australian Human Rights Commission allows people to make complaints to this now. You can make complaints to them about unlawful behavior. However, an unlawful act is not necessarily a criminal offense. Section 26 says that this act does not make it an offense to do an act that is unlawful because of this part, unless part 4 expressly says that it is an act of offense. For the purpose of subsection 1, an act is not to be done... An act is taken not to be done in private if it causes words, sound, images, or writing to be communicated to the public, or is done in a public space, or it is done in the sight or hearing of people who are in a public place. Now, in this section, a public place includes any place to which the public have access of right or by invitation, whether expressed or implied, and whether or not a charge is made for admission to the place. So, in other words, if you do something because of somebody's race, religion, sexual orientation, or gender in a public place, that includes Facebook, that includes YouTube, that includes the shopping center, that includes at a concert, that includes in a school, that includes a university, in a public sphere. If you do that and it offends or insults someone, you can be charged in this country. Now, interestingly enough, you cannot be charged in your own home because that is a private place, but if it's a public place, 
let me read that to you again because it, it's actually quite stunning. The act is reasonably likely in all circumstances to offend, insult, who humili humiliate or intimidate another person or a group of people. And the race is done because of race, color, national or ethnic origin of the person or some other group or all the people in the group. In other words, if you insult someone because of their race, you can be charged. Now, I am against racism. Racism is wrong. But what this law is saying is that people with guns, police officers, can come to you and arrest you for having said something offensive. Now, the interesting thing is, if it's likely to offend, likely to insult, how do you define those? They are not clearly defined. Something which offends one person may not offend another person. Something which makes one person feel insulted may not insult. In other words, this is completely subjective. Our ability to speak freely in this country is abridged by laws which give into people's feelings, people's subjective feelings. <laughs> Now, let me say this again. Let me say this unequivocally. Racism is wrong. All people are created in God's image. You should not be racist. You should not attack someone because of their race. You should not attack someone because of their color or national or ethnic origin or even their religion. You should not attack them because of this. But we should be able to criticize people from other groups without fearing being placed in jail or being taken to court. Because it is completely unreasonable to respond to speech with force. If you don't believe me, see what happens next time you try to punch someone who insults you. Very good chance you'll get in trouble because Australian law says it needs to be equal response, equal force. What's interesting <laughs> is the government gives themselves the power to use extra force which I think is completely unreasonable. So why do I hate speech laws now? Well, I'm going to give different reasons. So here's my first one. Because freedom of speech is meant to protect speech we do not like, not just speech we do. There is speech everyone hates. Everyone out there has a limit to things which they can listen to. There are things everyone out there will find offensive and everyone out there will not like. And the thing is, for, for different people, it's very different things. The whole point of freedom of speech is to protect speech we do not like. We would not need freedom of speech laws if people did not say things we do not like. So to pass hate laws goes against the fundamental basis of why we need freedom of speech. <laughs> the whole point of freedom of speech is to give people the ability to say things that you do not like. We don't need freedom of speech to protect speech we consider offensive, inane, or or immoral. We just don't need it. It's a ridiculous law. And the truth is, if you do not believe in protecting speech which you consider offensive, then you do not really believe in freedom of speech. See, so what is considered hateful changes from one generation to another anyway, sometimes even quicker. For example, just a few years ago, no one would have got offended if you said there were only two genders, male and female, or as we used to just call it, two sexes, male and female. Now, people, especially in some universities, humanities departments, need a safe space to protect them from people saying this because they get incredibly offended at the idea that there are people out there like you and me who believe that there are two genders. It's imperative. It's so important that we recognize that freedom of speech needs to be argued for even speech we dislike. In fact, especially for this kind of speech. That's the reason why freedom of speech laws are necessary and the reason, first reason why hate speech laws are so dumb. They are also dumb because words do not actually harm us. They can make us feel bad. But unless it is a direct incitement of violence, for example, this criminal says to this other criminal, go kill that person. Or it is defamation where someone publishes lies about you which can destroy your reputation and career unless it's these two situations the only thing that words can do is make us feel bad we can ignore insults 
We can ignore them. I've been insulted a lot of times in my life. I'm sure you have too. I'm sure you don't remember 99% of the situations that happened, and I'm sure in a lot of them you just ignore them. We can walk away. We don't have to cop people saying horrible things to us. We can walk away. In the case of social media, we can turn it off. I find this fascinating that we talk about online bullying as though it's this insidious kind of bullying that kids can't get away with. Sorry, can't get away from. Now, I understand why kids want to be plugged into social media because that's where their social networks, their social lives are functioning to a large degree today because that's how society has developed. I was a youth pastor for many years and I saw the way that kids did everything through Messenger or Snapchat or Tumblr or Instagram. They organized their events, they chatted to each other, they wanted to have discussions, debates, and they would sit at their homes in their different, their own bedrooms, you know, on other sides of the suburb or sometimes on the other side of the country if one of them was away and they'd have big discussion sessions through Messenger. I understand why people want to be so connected through these things, but the truth is, if somebody's saying something horrible to you through Facebook or Snapchat or Tumblr, you can turn it off and put the device down. I know, because I've done it. And we need to teach children that they can do it. But we can also respond. Harsh words can be responded to with harsh words, equal and equivalent force. <laughs> See, to call words violence is to fundamentally misunderstand violence. One punch can kill you if it is done right. But the only power that words can have over us are the power we let them have over us. And we can just say no. If we give them no power, they can do us no harm. And a big part of raising our young people is to teach them that principle. Because if you can just ignore people who are horrible to you, you're already a long way towards being successful in life. They also dumb because it is an attempt to control people's thoughts. Think about this. Hate speech laws use threat of violence, men armed with guns who can come and arrest you. Now, you might not think of the state in this way, but think about this. Why do police carry guns in Australia? because they can shoot you. If you resist in the wrong way, if you do something which is dangerous enough, they can shoot you. Now you're most likely not to get shot because our police in Australia, they are very restrained in the way they use force. And I thank God that I live in a country where our police are as responsible as they are here in Australia. There are other countries where they're not quite as responsible. So I thank God for the way our police work in this country. And I'm all for police officers. I thank God for the work they do in the community. I thank them for how dedicated they are to protecting us. But hate speech laws use the threat of violence to cause you to check your speech. Now, it may not be getting shot, but it may be getting arrested, put in handcuffs and locked up. Or it may be taken to court and fined and having to lose a big chunk of money. Or it may be having uh, your reputation dragged through the media because you've been arrested for saying something which the state said you should not say. So the force, this forces people to self-censor themselves, to self-censor. And this is not a good thing. Effectively, they use fear to try and influence how you think because what you say is directly connected to what you think. This is why Jordan Peterson said, remember in that debate with Kathy Newman on, I believe it was Channel 4 or something in Britain, and she asked him, why is your right to use the word you want more important than the right of a transgender person to not be offended by what you say? And he responded with that awesome phrase. Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. <laughs> Because without being able to speak, or speak what you want, you cannot think. And he stumped her because he was right. If you are not able to speak freely, you cannot think freely. One of the side effects of hate speech laws is to police our thinking. Because they get us to limit what we say, which means that these are laws which effectively are designed to get inside your head and mess with how you think so that you say the things the state says it's okay to say. I am not okay with this, and no one should be okay with this. They are also done because it puts way too much power on the straight, and that is an arbitrary power at that. Why do these people have the right to tell us what we can and cannot say? 
Those who are in government are not smarter than us, they are not better than us, they are not morally superior than us. What right do they have to determine what should and should not be said? In fact, history shows that those who rule over us have more often than not been the worst of us. These are people who often crave power, who crave influence, who crave the ability to make things happen in people's lives. And when they have that power, they often want to exercise it. And the truth is, this isn't just true of those who are in politics, it's true of bureaucrats, it's true of so many people, because the way human beings work is when you give us power, we want to exercise it. That's why there is the old saying, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. See, they cannot be trusted, those in the state cannot be trusted with the right to police our speech. I mean, think about this. Think of all the scandals that we've seen in Parliament just in the last few months. Think of Daniel Andrews' government in Victoria uh, misused 300 and something thousand dollars in their election campaign a few years ago and it helped them to get into government. They've apologised for it, going to pay it back. But are they morally superior to us? No. Think of Barnaby Joyce and his scandal where he cheated on his wife and got Vicky Campion pregnant. Is he morally superior to us? No. Why are these people who are just fallen people like us, why do they think that they can tell us what we can and cannot say? Our ability to think is equal to, and in many cases there are people in our society whose ability to think is much superior to those who are in Parliament. That's not a blight on Parliament. Parliament is just the average of humanity that we vote for. We vote for who we are. And so the people in Parliament are just like us. They're fallen people. And historically, this is really important to understand, historically, leaders have used speech laws to protect themselves from criticism. Hate speech laws may be different, but they train people to self-censor. They train people to hold back what they really want to say and to not speak up on certain taboo issues, which leads me on to my next point. And see, the other reason why hate speech laws are so dumb is because they are effectively a modern version of blasphemy laws. Now, every culture and every generation has had taboo things which you shouldn't talk about, which you shouldn't say, which should not be brought up. You know, many of you may not know this, but during the Reformation and after it, there were many people, most of them Christians, but some not, but many of them who were Christians who were fighting against the blasphemy laws of the state because they saw them as immoral and just as downright unjust. And they, they gave their lives in many cases. I encourage you to look up someone called Michael Sattler and read about his execution and look at why the way he was executed and what he was arguing for. He was simply just arguing to be able to believe what he believed the Bible was saying and to gather with people who believed the same thing. And they killed him in the most barbaric and torturous way. Starting in the time frame when Michael Sattler was born, there were people like Balthazar Hubmar and others who started saying, it is wrong that we punish people for what they say. See, many people don't realize this, but it was Christians who started to fight against the blasphemy laws of the Christian state. One, they didn't believe the state was very Christian because it was doing things that Christ would not say. In fact, you may not know this, but the very foundation of freedom of speech and the foundation that we should not punish people, that we should not punish people for what they say comes from the New Testament. For example, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, just as you would expect someone to treat you and, uh, and let you share your opinion, so you should let someone else share their opinion. Balthazar Hubmai wrote this brilliant document called Concerning Heretics and Those Who Burnt Them. In it, he argued that we should not punish someone for what they say because God does not force anyone to believe what he wants them to believe. He gives them the choice. So therefore, people should be given the choice and the way that we should... Con Vert them is through reason, through arguments, through scripture, through sitting down and talking with them. In the 16th century, in the 1520s, Baltasar Hubma argued in medieval, at the end of the medieval period in Europe, the beginning of the modern period, or starting to get to the beginning of the modern period, he argued that even Muslims should not be persecuted for their beliefs because Jesus said that we shall not try to rip out the tares because we might accidentally pull up some of the wheat. In other words, both believers and non-believers should be allowed to live in society alongside each other without fear of violent persecution. The very foundation of 
freedom of speech, freedom of association is the teachings of Jesus. And they were fighting against the blasphemy laws of the church. Why would we want to bring in new blasphemy laws? Because that is effectively what hate speech laws are. They are blasphemy. They are saying, you will be punished by the state if you cross this line and say this. That is a blasphemy law. That is what the medieval church did. Why would we want to go back to that? Many people fought and gave their lives. And when I say fought, I mean with their words. These were peaceful people who, many of them died in cruel and painful ways. Many of them were hung, drawn, and quartered. Many of them were burnt at the stake. Michael Sattler had parts of his flesh torn out with red-hot tongs. These people gave their lives to fight against blasphemy laws. And here we are just a few hundred years later, allowing our governments to bring them back into place. And this is not a good thing. Blasphemy laws allow the state to use violence, imprisonment, fines, or worse in the past, to force us not to speak on certain topics. It cools dissent and forces people to self-censor, as I've already said several times, and this empowers the state to keep the status quo. And the status quo includes them being the ones in power. Another reason why hate speech laws are dumb is because it places minorities in danger. Think about this. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the greatest people of the 20th century. How did he win people to his cause? By speech. In fact, by great speeches. He got up on behalf of African Americans in the United States in the Civil Rights Movement and argued against the laws which were oppressing his fellow black people, and he was right to do it. And he won people over with his speech. Now, he was only able to do this in the United States because in the United States, his free speech was protected under law. Free speech allows minorities to be able to argue for their rights against the state without fear of repression from the state. I want you to think about this, and some Christians might not like this example, but just hear me out. How did homosexual people win the Australian society over to same-sex marriage? Through speech. Through TV shows where they shared their perspective. Through interviews on things like Sunrise and, and the Channel 9 morning show, which I always forget what it's called. In other words, they've reasoned with people for decades and they finally, they, they had uh, discussions in Parliament, discussions on Q&A, discussions all over the place. And they won people over without any violence. They won people over with speech. Now, as a Christian, I don't agree with same-sex marriage. But I can respect the right of those I disagree with to put forward their perspective and win people over. Because we should live in a society where people are able to share their views, no matter what they are, and then people can respond with other arguments. Now, this is not me defending this is a good decision by our society, just because people were won over doesn't mean they were won over to the right thing. <laughs> As a Christian, obviously, we don't believe that. But what I do believe is people should not fear persecution because of what they believe. They should be treated respectfully and given the ability to share their views without fear of harm. Jesus believed this, the Anabaptists and the Baptists believed this, and this influenced the modern world. And so we would be stupid to go back to a time where people can be punished by the state because of what they say. And this happens. A young man in, in Scotland just went to jail for putting up a joke that he did with his, with his girlfriend's dog. Now, I've seen the joke. It's offensive. It's thoroughly offensive, and I would never do the same kind of joke myself because it was way over the line. And he should repent and ask for forgiveness for what he did. And he should ask for the forgiveness of every Jewish person in the world because of that joke. It was very offensive. But it is not reasonable for him to spend time in jail just because he offended some people. If he didn't go to court, most people in the world wouldn't even know that he did that video. It's ironic because by punishing him, the state have actually made his platform larger. This is in the United Kingdom as well. This is a place which has a great tradition of, of freedom of speech. It also has a great tradition of repression if you go back far enough. But for a long time there, this freedom was part of that society. And it's one of the reasons why the United Kingdom was so successful. 
So, hate speech laws are done because they place minorities in danger. But I want to finish with this reason why hate speech laws are done. Because freedom of speech is the freedom which makes possible all of our other freedoms. Think about it. Scientific inquiry needs freedom of speech. You need to be able to say whatever you're thinking about a particular theory to be able to challenge it and get towards a better theory. Education. We need to be able to educate people about many different things in our society. If you make these things, if you make these, if you make certain topics no-go zones, then we cannot educate our young people on how to think rightly about these things. Research. We need to be able to go down any, every avenue of research that is possible so we can get to the most intelligent conclusions. Public broadcasting, the ability to challenge the government, the ability to put forth arguments, the ability to reason with the public, all of this is undergirded by one principle. People should be free to say what they are thinking. Freedom of speech. If you can speak freely, you can think freely, you can believe freely, and you can associate freely with people that believe the same things which you believe. It is the foundation upon which an open, secular, reasonable, and free society is based. So we need to oppose hate speech laws. We need to argue for freedom of speech. We need to love our neighbor and argue on their behalf that just like we think our opinions should be given an air to be heard, so should theirs. We shouldn't try to silence people. What happens when people share really bad ideas? Well, often, just by them sharing them, they will lose listeners. Because most people, can, when they hear stupid, they can recognize it. <laughs> but not only that, if people are free to share bad ideas, they're also free to be opposed by good ideas. In other words, the way you strike down bad ideas is with better ideas. And the way that you're able to do this is if you have a free society where everyone can speak freely without fear of harm. I really hope this has been helpful for you today. This is Matram, signing off. I'll catch you later.